Our program focuses on health care, so why are we talking about homes? It's because there's a national effort underway that's showing how green and healthy homes can make a big difference for the people who live in those homes. We took that, we went into the Maryland legislature with a plan to uh, reduce and eradicate childhood lead poisoning that we have built on, we built on over a decade and a half. We put standards in place, things that say, if you are a landlord, you're not in compliance with the Maryland lead law, you may not collect rent. We're talking with Ruth Ann Norton, the president and CEO of the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. They believe that we can address the social determinants of health through healthy, safe, and energy efficient homes. Doctors, I call it, you know, our work is a doctor's relief act because doctors who are in the business of wellness want to know that all of the other contributing factors can help them help the patient be better. This is Conversations on Healthcare. Well, Ruth Ann Norton, welcome to Conversations on Healthcare. It's my favorite conversation to have about housing, so thank you. <laughs> well, you know, you run such a great uh, national nonprofit, which is really dedicated to advancing racial and health equities and opportunities through healthy housing which are all very important goals, but maybe you could share with our listeners exactly how you're making this happen. Well, uh, so we've been at it about 31 years uh, and finally feel that a number of things are coming together. So I, I tell my staff the tide is finally meeting us at the shore on um, <laughs> this work. But our approach is to look at the health of residents and the health of housing and try to address them together. So we understand that if we remove lead paint in housing, that we will have children uh, and uh, newborns, right, who will not be impacted by the neurological, cardiac and kidney impacts of lead poisoning. If we improve the structures of homes so that we don't have mold, mildew, moisture, or pest issues, better ventilation, we will reduce the incidence of asthma in children, asthma in our older adult population, improvements in COPD, therefore improving a kid's ability to get in the classroom healthy and ready to learn, and an older adult's ability to live with greater quality of health as they age. We couple that with injury and fall prevention and energy efficiency work, everything from weatherization to decarbonization and electrification to solar. And we do that for a number of reasons. One is economic outcomes. Two are the outcomes on health and quality of life. And three, a better improvement for not only the value of the home and the stability of the home, but it is better for our overarching health. And what we know is that we have shown um, in very hard uh, patient and analyzed data and cost data that we have massive improvements to our healthcare systems, to the ability to reinvest and the ability to be tangible and transformational in communities to invest where we have overlooked and dis, uh, disenfranchised communities for a long time and create better, more resilient, healthier communities and be able to lead where we have left uh, people on an island in the past. And so we're really forward thinking about, especially the climate pieces of this, to make sure that we do not make the mistakes of the generations before us. Well, Ruthann, you are uh, tackling some of the most persistent problems in health uh, that we have known about for a long time. So I want to give you a chance to zero in on a few of your tactical approaches. Uh, your supporters uh, use your comprehensive housing intervention model and a best practices toolbox. Tell us about them. How do they work? What's what's in the toolbox and what's the set of interventions? Well, you know, I think our number one tool is that it, it's just tenacity right on this. But what we are effectively doing in housing policy, you've seen this pass into legislation in Pennsylvania. We've seen Maryland transform. Many states are transforming to what we call a whole house approach. So 
when I, in the opening, I talked about the health of families and residents and the health of housing. Our assessment, which we developed with HUD, CDC, Department of Energy, EPA, and others, and healthcare, really looks at how do we look at the health of individuals, what in their house is impacting their health or their opportunities, and then how do we look holistically? So it means that in that comprehensive assessment, we're going to measure indoor air quality and ventilation and the things that matter about weatherization, about whether or not we should uh, you know, make measures to decarbonize if there's carbon emitting appliances, all of that, uh, and how we can upgrade electrical systems, right? We are also looking at those things that are hidden dangers, whether it's lead paint, whether it's mold, mildew, and moisture, right? Or other uh, things such as trip and fall preventable trip mm -hmm. and fall injuries in the home. And we then develop a single scope of work and we don't any longer ask families to go hunt for the five, 10, 15 different programs that they may need to get to that housing stability and health standpoint, right? We also are calculating what are the cost savings that happen we are tracking whether kids get into the school better. So in our study we did for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development through this align, braid, coordinate approach showed that we improved school attendance to perfect attendance from chronic absenteeism by 62%. Mm. Now, <clears throat> that's not necessarily a health measure, but it's certainly a social determinant of health measure. Absolutely. We also reduced asthma admissions in the hospital in Baltimore by 66%, in Philadelphia by 70 and 77%, Cleveland by 58%. That is pretty tremendous work. And, uh, and we have done over 40 feasibility studies uh, with support from Robert Wood Johnson uh, and the Corporation for National Community uh, Service and JPB to look at those healthcare dollars, right? What does it translate into? And today we manage programs for people, uh, entities like Blue Cross and Molina and uh, Amerigroup WellPoint because they see those outcomes. But in short, we are looking to say what in a home, regardless of what door they came, family came to us, whether it's need of weatherization because they're cold, kid has uh, exposure to lead, right? There's people going to the emergency room for asthma. Whatever the pathway that brings you to need to have your house assessed, we look holistically with the family, find that scope, braid the funds, and then measure the outcomes. Um, and it's, it's a pretty straightforward, common sense proposition. The hard work is just moving systems to align and do this. Um, but you know, we're, we've seen that happen, whether it's Delaware, New Jersey, Michigan, it's happening. Boy, there's so much of what you just said that I, I really like, uh, also just thinking about moving systems, you've really provided, uh, an organizational roadmap for healthcare providers, right? Uh, to think about how they can move outside of their four walls. You know, I think it's fair to say that, uh, a patient's in seeing us for 100 minutes a year is sort of what the, the numbers are. But they're in their home thousands, tens of thousands of minutes, right? And that's where you can provide this very important health care improvement uh, and it increase their wellness uh, by really focusing in on, on, on the home. So I think you've provided a great tool uh, for healthcare care organizations to reconceptualize uh, the sort of delivery model. And I really like the uh, point, Margaret, you, we've been talking about this. You've raised this whole issue on absenteeism, how that is such a marker for uh, families or young people who may not be functioning well when that absenteeism is high. Uh, so Ruth Ann, lots to digest here, but talk a little bit about the organizational model and redesign the systems change that you're trying to not only exercise, execute in terms of making homes healthy, but also being an exemplar for healthcare organizations to redefine their work. 
not only healthcare organizations, but federal agencies, right? Uh, today, the U.S. Department of Energy now considers health and safety as part of their pre-weatherization, right? They're considering how are we going to address health and safety and housing as they're considering the $27 billion of investment they're going to put into greenhouse gas emissions, right? But from healthcare, let's take it from a couple of ways, right? So I've been in uh, my position for 31 years here. We started out looking at lead paint, right? It started to grow because both the workers that we have in the field, the guys cleaning up housing, our home visitors, and our families that we worked with said, you can't just clean up lead because when you leave, we're still unhealthy. We're still at risk. And our data showed that and it showed housing instability. But what was also happening was the conversation with the doctors at the Harriet Lane Clinic at Hopkins and other clinics right the, across the country, which was they write a script for asthma knowing they're sending a kid back to a place that's only going to exacerbate that problem. Or we would chelate kids for lead knowing that we're sending them back and they're gonna come back because of the exposures. Doctors, I call it, you know, our work is a doctor's relief act. Because doctors who are in the business of wellness want to know that all of the other contributing factors can help them help the patient be better. So we are really trying to ensure that when somebody hits that emergency room, right, that we are able to go in, do the assessment, clean up the hazards, and eliminate, if we can, the return to the emergency room or hospitalization for something like asthma. What we're also doing is helping healthcare get to a wellness standard. So many people who work in healthcare, whether they're doctors or administrators or, or in, in plans and programs across the country, have the goal of wellness. And we're able to align both the return on investment, the economic return with the human outcome return by this work and be able to use mechanisms like value-based purchasing, right? Or investments in social determinants of health or hospital community benefit programs to do, the, uh, to help support mm -hmm. the outcomes for the very reason that people get into healthcare, mm -hmm. to make people healthier, right? We're all on this journey together. We get to do that. And the exciting kind of piece of this is we can, you know, we're in it for a moral compass reason around health and around outcomes, right, for families. But we can do it, and the business case supports us. The data supports us. And, you know, we spent a long time learning how to do the economic analysis with Milliman, um, who was a partner, who's an actuarial firm, and who eventually said, you got this, go do it. So we're a high trust audit agency now. We can actually do that analysis as part of the evaluation and be able to change things. In California, we help to change the statutes that are now allowing Medi-Cal to use the in lieu of statute for doctors to write a script for people who have asthma and be able to have up to $7,500 where that can include moderate home repair to address the issues that are causing the asthma. And the, Margaret, ultimate, it reminds like, the ultimate dream is that, right? Right, it, it also reminds me of our early days in the health center movement where Dr. Jack Geiger was writing prescriptions for food. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is on the, on the same yeah. level. That's it, yeah. that's yeah. it, right? Well, and we know, we know this is a healthcare measure in all forms, maybe not by all regulation, yeah. right? Well, I want I just want to make sure our audience knows uh, how radical the work is that you're doing. Uh, and I will date myself by saying 50 years ago, I started my career as a rural public health nurse, and I was out there measuring lead in the walls and treating children wow. who had lead poisoning. But you are known as the architect of Maryland's 99% reduction in childhood lead poisoning. That is a story we want to hear. We all know about his dangers, but to achieve a 99% reduction is really phenomenal. How did that come about? Why isn't this the national agenda every day? Tell us about that. 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll say 99.4. We're not done All right, 99.4. <laughs> and uh, according to Duke University, uh, for all respect for everybody who went to Duke, they're my nemesis because I went to UNC. But uh, <laughs> they have reported that we returned in the first, in 12 years, we achieved that 98% reduction. And they uh, did a study showing a $44.5 billion economic return to the state of Maryland. And I'll come back to that in just a minute, because that did not improve housing condition per se by itself. So again, why we are doing this more holistically. What we did was made the case on data. What we did was made the case on why in the world we're reinvesting state legislative dollars in graduation rates, in school attendance, in improved educational systems and not doing the one very tangible thing right. to ensure that we can get there, which was not to damage the brains of young children before they could get to a classroom and fail grade level rating, right? And we and the all the downhill slope that goes from that. So we went into the Maryland legislature. Uh, you know, there was an article headline in the Baltimore Sun that I still have in my office that said efforts to prevent childhood lead poisoning are doomed to fail. And uh, so we took that. We went into the Maryland legislature with a plan to uh, reduce and eradicate childhood lead poisoning that we have built on. We built on over a decade and a half. We put standards in place, things that say, if you are a landlord, you're not in compliance with the Maryland lead law, you may not collect rent in rent court because your house is an illegal rental. It's just the facts of the law. We call it the clean hand statute. We've uh, put legislation in place to prevent um, evictions because people have lead poison kids. We stop landlords from asking about lead poisoning. But what mostly we made the case to the public in Maryland that we did not want to have a brain damaged society when we had the tools to prevent it. And so even for the opposition in the legislature at the time we were fighting this out, so much so that my picture was up as a dartboard uh, <laughs> for the, uh, the people working on the other side. What an honor. <laughs> uh, yeah. But now we have such a high rate of compliance. It's better business for the rental property owners. It's better business for the real estate community. It is a better outcome for our schools. Um, and we are starting to see the seeds of that in other areas. In uh, you know, while uh, in in the census tracts where we did the work, crime rates are actually down. Housing stability is up. People are investing more. In, uh, in housing. But what we also did is that in that learning was to understand to get the lead out, we had to do all of these other things around mm -hmm. housing. Mm -hmm. If you have a house that is extremely cold and extremely hot because it's poorly weatherized, that will cause underlying paint to chip, peel, flake, and become toxic dust. Mm -hmm. So you have to fix that, not only for the cost, but for the envelope of that house. Um, I would say the Maryland lead law though, Margaret, is a gold standard beyond any. It just got replicated in this many years later in part by Rhode Island. The city of Philadelphia has replicated parts of it. Uh, Michigan just followed us in universal blood lead testing. And the one thing I will say in the commitment of the state of Maryland regardless of party of our governors over the past 30 years or our legislature, it has been the one clear true North um, that every single governor has had a hallmark piece of advancement in this work. So we made it something all of us mm -hmm. can own and champion and as far as I'm concerned, the champions are those property owners that clean up their houses, are the families who help to report and clean that up, are the legislature, mm -hmm. legislators. We've pushed the idea and we've had the courage to enforce the law. 
Well, speaking of champions, and, and you've seen over your 31 years uh, lots of uh, activity going on in the field that you're in and have been leading. I'm thinking about, Margaret, the opportunity we had to interview the folks from Flint, Michigan on their uh, right. lead in the pipes, uh, Joseph Allen from Harvard on healthy buildings, Lindsey Marr from the Green uh, uh, Council there. Uh, so you've got a lot of allies that are happening. How are you all organizing together and trying to share uh, uh, best practices with each other so that uh, we can have more visibility uh, to what works effectively. And I really want to applaud your policy focus and research focus about uh, measuring and getting good outcomes on these and sharing those. But tell us a little bit about the larger field and how you're working collectively there. Well, I, I will tell you that we steal completely from Brene Brown and we call it data with a soul. Um, right. The data and the family story is what matters. Right. Yeah. Uh, we just had a family that we did our whole house strategy, lead paint all the way to electrification, cleaning up all the hazards in between. And for the first time, a grandmother was was able to have her six year old grandchild spend the night for the first time. Mm. That's the stuff that matters. Um, so we are in a network, uh, GHHI has a network of over 1,700 partners across the country, uh, but we kind of, it's we network this in every level we can, whether it's the National Governors Association or the National League of Cities or Conference of Mayors, but mostly we are uh, really on the ground with nonprofits, uh, mayor's offices, healthcare uh, across the country. And uh, we so we have some pretty wide networks in our collaborative approach um, and really focus on what those collaborations that exist in communities to go in and join underneath, not try to create something new. So in Detroit, we're in the housing task force uh, community. We're also the co-manager uh, or, or uh, working with uh, Enterprise uh, to uh, to support them in uh, managing the Detroit Home Repair Fund, uh, which is funded mainly by the Gilbert Foundation and DTE. Um, we go into communities where there isn't collaboration, isn't a network, and try to build that. We've done that in Mississippi, helping to create a healthy homes network in Mississippi. And then we tie this, it, it, again, through many different networks, through the uh, grant networks of the Office of Lead Hazard Control and Healthy Housing, through the climate and green networks that exist. Um, so I would have to tell you there's not one bullet in that. It's more mm -hmm. about joining and moving this message, this mission into existing collaborations and going where things don't exist and helping to build up uh, learning networks and action networks that to make them uh, be able to walk and stand and uh, run on their own. We are firmly built to to really focus in on uh, this uh, coordinate strategy, align braid coordinate strategy of housing. So we we also cross sector that at every level. Mayor's office, right? Health and housing, state health and housing, the nonprofit community who can execute housing that. Of, housing authorities as well in that? Housing authorities as well for the public housing side. Yeah. Yep. Well, I hope you find a, a strong partner in the uh, National Network of Community Health Centers uh, across the country because well, it's certainly I, near and dear to their hearts as well. But Ruthann, I, I wonder if I can uh, ask it seems to me because we work in many cities and we obviously have been around uh, the country, there are neighborhoods uh, in some of our cities where the neglect and all but abandonment by the owners of the property have resulted in housing stock that is so deteriorated. I, I'm curious, do you ever find yourself uh, at the point where your coalitions are making recommendations not to salvage and fix, but to raise and build new communities for people? A hundred percent. I mean, I think there, you know, there is a point at which we we care deeply on this issue across the board, but let me talk about lowest income homeowners who sometimes get left on an island in communities because the disinvestment is so high uh, and they've aged and the ability, right? 
to salvage uh, housing situations. Uh, we look at that aspect of ownership, right, of uh, the ability to make the investments within reason. Um, and, uh, and sometimes it'll be higher than what, you know, we, we would want on average. But if you can invest $65,000 into a home that then can be assessed at 250 to 300,000 or even 150,000. Mm -hmm. The question is the value of that, right? But the value in stabilizing neighborhoods in the value of what people own and not them losing their asset, right, is critical to this. But certainly we are we all we wrote the national standard on uh lead safe demolition and environmentally safe de demolition because we do understand that some housing is so far gone that it has to come down. Mm -hmm. And we modeled that behavior in East Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, where there was a determination made between the city, the state, and nonprofits um, to really look at a community. And we relocated the families that were kind of left on the island and in the heart of East Baltimore and they were given money to buy a home to support that or to move into better housing situations and the ability to come back to the community when new things were rebuilt. Um, it's a dramatic choice to make. It's a hard choice for mayors to make. Mm -hmm. um, but the goal is, will people be healthier? But you have to take many things into account. When you move an elderly population, that could possibly accelerate their mortality uh, because you are ripping away emotional supports, uh, not only unhealthy housing right issues. Uh, you have to ensure that where people are given an opportunity to go uh, is important. But also there is strategically the choice to take down some vacant housing in neighborhoods because it's being occupied illegally, it's unhealthy, it could cause a fire hazard, it could cause other hazards, it, and uh, we can make a better choice of reinvesting in different ways. But we look hard at this to say, if it can be saved, right, and we can make it healthier, and we can invest and not continue to let it go, uh, we can prevent foreclosures. We did a study for Open Society a number of years ago showing that we can build vitality, we can build health, um, but it takes a cooperative judgment on that. Let, let me get one last question in because you got some good news recently from the Environmental Protection Agency selecting your organization. I think uh, 11 total to direct part of the Environmental Justice Thriving Communities grant making program. I think about $50 million that you're sharing Tell, tell our listeners about the program and what we can look forward to. Yeah, so we were we were awarded uh, fifty million dollars uh, for Region Three, uh, which is Pennsylvania, uh, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, District of Columbia, and uh, in that in that region, and then our the region where both uh, we I am sitting, uh, we will be helping to build the capacity of organizations around the environment, environmental health, environmental justice, and the Justice 40 initiatives to lift in disinvested communities a health and environmental health forward uh, and justice message. Uh, GHHI, I believe, was chosen uh, because we have uh, grown in stature. We've been through the, the journey of starting mm -hmm. with one person and $17,000 mm -hmm to now uh, being $20 million a year in our work across the nation. Wonderful. And I think we have a particular understanding of the resources that it takes, the supports it takes. So we will be running competitions to give out grants, 350,000, 250,000, and 75,000 over the next uh, three years across the region to lift up this work but we're also going to try to work with philanthropy to match fund uh, this where we can uh, to make uh, help train people how to work with healthcare, how to do uh, many of the things that uh, whether it's improving 
their waterways, their byways, their homes. Um, it's an incredible uh, honor for us uh, to be in this position, uh, to have the mission that we have. Building the capacity of others is the way that we all build health together. And uh, we're big believers in that. So, but I'm just Great. thrilled to have time to spend with both of you today. I appreciate the time that you've given us. Great. Well, Ruth Ann Norton, thank you for joining us for this great conversation. Thanks to our audience for being here. Be sure to subscribe to our videos on YouTube. As always, you can go online to chcradio.com to sign up for email updates. And please share your thoughts and your comments about this program. Ruth Ann, thank you again. Congratulations on all the accomplishments. And I know much more work to be done. Indeed. Thank you so much. Grateful great. to both of you. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Conversations on Healthcare or its affiliated entities.